Hey guys, this might seem like a little bit of an old ancient history kind of a topic to bring up, but I wanted to talk about the bill that sparked the entire movement in Hong Kong that's been going on for months now. And the reason I wanted to do something on this topic is because there isn't really anything out there that gives a comprehensive, all-inclusive, and truthful commentary on the extradition bill. Furthermore, a lot has happened recently that ties into the full story of the extradition bill. I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible. You've probably noticed that I have some new long format videos where I sit down with a guest who lives in China to have a general unscripted chat about China and or their own personal experiences elsewhere. Because as silly as it may seem, there are a lot of people who are surprised that there are intelligent, funny and interesting people who are very well thought out, who are from China or have chosen to move to China. Now, you may not think I'm any of those things, but I'm hoping that by doing that series, I can expose you to some of the people who you will find to be all of those things. But back onto topic. When I do these info-related videos on a specific topic, I want to try to keep it as brief as possible with the most important, relevant, and missing information included. So regarding the extradition bill, as many of you know, it was a bill that would have allowed China to extradite criminals from Hong Kong over to the mainland side. As you are probably led to believe, this would have allowed China to grab anyone they wanted from Hong Kong whenever they wanted, including visitors who are simply passing through Hong Kong for a few hours on a layover to somewhere else. Well, that is total BS. Hong Kong has extradition agreements with other countries, including the US, but they don't have one with Taiwan or China. Interestingly enough, criminals were extradited back to China from Hong Kong before handover under the British, but nobody really cared about it then. People are only really taking an interest in it now. From a technical standpoint, this extradition bill was actually a proposal to simply modify Hong Kong's existing fugitives ordinance so that it included China and Taiwan into this system. The original reason for pushing this through was because a Hong Kong man named Chan Tong Kai had murdered his pregnant girlfriend in Taiwan, folded her body into a suitcase, discarded it, and then flew back to Hong Kong. He actually admitted to the murder, but there was no mechanism to send him back to Taiwan. And the Hong Kong legal system doesn't allow for much flexibility outside of strictly following the rules. He was scheduled to be released in October 2019, and Hong Kong wanted to update their fugitives ordinance to be able to send him back to face justice in Taiwan. Because of the timing issue, there was a bit of a rush in order to prevent this criminal from fleeing elsewhere the moment he was released. And this did indeed create a situation where the quality of communication surrounding the bill was terrible. The government really did a poor job here. Now, I just want to slip some additional context in here on a slightly related kind of side note. Hong Kong practices a kind of basic law which does not allow them to charge their own citizens for crimes committed outside of Hong Kong. China's system does allow the mainland to do this. If a mainland Chinese citizen commits a murder anywhere in the world, the Chinese government has the ability to prosecute them in China based on them being a Chinese mainland person. Other countries work this way also for certain crimes. For example, Australia is known to prosecute Australian sexual predators who commit crimes elsewhere. Now, in order for Hong Kong to create an extradition bill for Taiwan to be allowed to send this criminal back, from a technical standpoint, they need to make one for China at the same time. Because as you're probably aware, China, like the UN, considers Taiwan to be a part of China. And you can disagree with this if you like, but it shouldn't really be a concern to Taiwan in terms of this bill, which would have allowed Taiwan to access criminals fleeing Taiwan to China mainland and to Hong Kong. And they could continue to refuse to extradite any mainland criminals back to China from Taiwan if they so wish. From a practical standpoint, everything else regarding the bill is simply an internal matter between Hong Kong and mainland China. However, Taiwan refused to cooperate if Hong Kong took this approach with this bill. And Taiwan suggested that they should just handle this murder uh, as a one-off case basis. Taiwan simply wanted to cause issues here, and that will become even more obvious and apparent as I continue with the story here. So on to some of the meat of the bill itself. In its initial form, there were a lot of concerns raised regarding the bill because of the difference in standards be between China and Hong Kong's judicial systems. In fact, even Professor Albert Chen of the University of Hong Kong um, in the faculty of law there, said he had concerns too. And he's usually pro-Beijing, so that made pretty good local news. After all, here we have even the pro-Beijing guy worrying about this bill. Now that says a lot, eh? Professor Chen listed out all of his concerns as the government listened in to him and the rest of the legal community's opinion as well, and it resulted in the proposed bill being modified to create safeguards for all of the listed concerns. These amendments to the proposed bill were all made before the protests began, but the media continued to quote Professor Chen's old comments from when he had concerns with the bill. 
even though all of those concerns were addressed with modifications, causing him to subsequently even say that, well, now the bill actually makes a lot of sense. As we all know, the protests were still pushed forward anyways, and it got pretty darn violent. Even after the bill was withdrawn, the protesters morphed into something else, with goalposts that moved to include demands that will obviously never be met, such as the demand to absolve all rioters and protesters of their terrible crimes against the city and innocent people. But before I leave the topic of the actual proposed bill itself, I want to explain to you why it was a totally reasonable proposal. I've spoken to many protest supporters, and I've always asked them for their reasoning behind why they didn't like the extradition bill or they didn't want it to pa be passed, even though, as I said, it seemed completely reasonable to me. Well, here is how the Q&A usually goes. First, they'll say, the bill puts everyone at risk for deportation to China, including foreigners. This is incorrect. The extradition bill covered mainland-based crimes. Hong Kong criminals committing crimes in Hong Kong would still be handled locally by their own courts. It would have been virtually impossible to extradite someone who hasn't been to the mainland based on the fact that the crime needed to take place there. Next, they say China could grab somebody based on trumped up political or humanitarian or activism related charges. This is also incorrect. All of these types of crimes were excluded from the extradition eligibility, along with many other categories of concerns, which were addressed in those amendments I had spoken about. Next, they say, but there are many other crimes that are illegal in the mainland that aren't crimes in Hong Kong. In order to be eligible for extradition, the crime needs to be considered a crime in both the mainland and in Hong Kong. The crime needs to be a crime that comes with a penalty of at least a seven-year sentence or more in both Hong Kong and the mainland. It's notably more than the three-year threshold that other regions where Hong Kong has an extradition agreement with follows by. They have a three-year rule, for example, with the U.S. This was actually one of the amendments also that we were talking about. Furthermore, on top of all of this, extradition is even further restricted with requirements to be one of a handful of crimes mostly made up of violent acts such as rape and murder. Next, what I usually hear is, well, the bill gives the chief executive too much power to order an extradition to anyone who went to the mainland whom they can pin something on, especially considering that the chief executive is loyal to Beijing. Aside from this being a false statement in so many regards, the bill gives the chief executive no power to simply order an extradition, but would provide great power for them to refuse or stop one. If the Hong Kong court system doesn't agree with the extradition, the chief executive cannot override their decision and order that extradition. However, if the courts do agree with an extradition, she can refuse to give her final approval or rubber stamp, however you want to say it. So basically, she has more power to stop an extradition than she does to order one. I'm using the word she right now based on the uh, chief executive being Carrie Lam, but of course it applies to whoever is the chief executive in the future and whatever their preferred gender pronoun is. Next, what I usually hear is that it puts basically all past visitors to the mainland at risk of having bogus crimes pinned on them. And a lot of people have been to the mainland. Well, the Hong Kong courts will review the request and examine the evidence. All of the evidence supplied needs to be of a quality that would also be admissible in the Hong Kong courts for an equivalent local crime. Keep in mind, a strong case can be made to prove that Hong Kong courts are also very anti-mainland leaning based on their past decisions and penalties towards Hong Kongers versus mainlanders or police. The accused will also have the opportunity to appeal a decision made to extradite them. Next, what I sometimes hear is, well, if they are finally extradited, they're not going to have a fair trial in China and their courts aren't transparent. Well, the bill actually specifically states the principles on how the case should be tried in the mainland and is auditable because it also requires the trial to be completely open to the public. In this case, the attempted fear-mongering that had people saying the bill is not a matter for only Hong Kong to decide on in a fully autonomous way, it's actually true, but it's something that's entirely reasonable. This was a Hong Kong proposed bill, but it relied on the cooperation of the mainland to do things the Hong Kong way. And it turned out the mainland was far more flexible and willing than Taiwan was here. Next, they say, another thing they've heard is that criminals shouldn't be extradited to China because unlike in Hong Kong, they practice the death penalty there. The bill mentions this problem as well and maintains that criminals will not be extradited unless China agrees not to use this punishment if any extradited criminal eventually is found to be guilty in China. There is an answer to pretty much every single concern about this bill. I could literally go on and on here, but what I usually like to end with is me asking them a question. 
And when I ask this question, I like to personalize it by tying into the general dislike of mainlanders many Hong Kongers have. I ask them to imagine a violent mainland criminal who has a temporary or permanent Hong Kong ID card and has just escaped the mainland after raping and murdering someone. I told them to imagine that this person has now moved in next door to them, but the Hong Kong government has no mechanism to do anything about it. What should be done? Most of the time, the answer I get is that Hong Kong should handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. My jaw usually <laughs> drops at this point. Think about that. Instead of extraditions coming with strict guidelines and documentation about what can and can't be done with an appeals process built in, with requirements put on the mainland government in terms of how they should deal with the trial, they'd rather do it on the fly, like it's the Wild West or something. They haven't really thought this one through, have they? No one has, because the sensationalized China bad fear mongering is way more entertaining, even if it doesn't really make any sense at all. I can tell you, though, I truly believe that if this criminal who had murdered his girlfriend was a mainlander, we would have an extradition bill by now. And that's a whole side of the topic in terms of a dislike towards mainlanders in Hong Kong that I've covered before, and I'm not going to get into too much here. But one thing I will say is the bill would have actually helped Hong Kong gain power over China in some ways also. The bill would have acted as a two-way extradition agreement, further emphasizing why the bill needed China's blessing as well. Because what it will do is criminals who commit crimes in Hong Kong and escape to China would have been extradited back to Hong Kong under the same framework of this agreement. Now, as a matter of fact, China has already a pretty generous history in this regard. They have typically swiftly caught Hong Kong-based criminals and sent them back, handing them over to the Hong Kong authorities. There was one case even after the protest started of a man who murdered someone in Yanlong, ran away to China, and he was swiftly caught and sent back to Hong Kong. This story is ultra relevant to this topic of extraditions, which has been subject to mass global media coverage, but we didn't hear anything about it. No major news networks covered this. Speaking of inefficient coverage, there is something else that happened that should have been way bigger news than it was. Well, you know that murderer who was set to be released in October? While he was locked up, a pastor had come and convinced him to promise to turn himself into Taiwan after he was released. Well, when that news came out that he was successful in convincing him, <laughs> Taiwan immediately put a ban not only on the murderer, but also the pastor who convinced him to turn himself in, preventing them both from being able to fly back into Taiwan. Yes, this is not a joke. But apparently this, let's deal with this as a one-off case, was a joke. They never really did want a solution. And the objection to this extradition bill was just a cover. As you can imagine, there were a few people who had some pretty colorful words to describe Taiwan after this turn of events. Taiwan did come back and try to appear reasonable, but actually moved the goalposts to a deliberately designed impossible target to hit. What they did was they said that Hong Kong needed to allow Taiwanese, Taiwanese police to enter Hong Kong to make the arrests themselves. They know full well that Hong Kong's legal system will not allow this. And how anyone can advocate giving foreign law enforcement from around the world jurisdiction in Hong Kong while also pretending to care about their autonomy is beyond me. I don't think I need to elaborate on how messed up this point is any further. So let me quickly jump back to the topic of China returning criminals to Hong Kong for a moment. China has actually done this many times over the years. Even in July 2018, last year, a group of mainlanders who robbed a watch shop were all caught in China and returned to Hong Kong with the 33 watches and six bracelets they stole. Taiwan isn't so great on this point. Also well after the protest started, on October 6th, a man from Taiwan robbed a watch shop using an air gun to threaten the staff, then safely flew back to Taiwan before he was caught, where he's enjoying life now. It almost seems like he was rubbing salt into this wound and deliberately making fun of the whole system, or at least exploiting it at bare minimum. Now, I have to say, though, China hasn't always sent criminals back. There was a famous case back in 2002, well, locally well-known at the time. There was a mainland man who went in and murdered a powerful businessman in Hong Kong who had a lot of business in mainland China, including being involved in the big uh, Guanlan golf course in Shenzhen here. The murderer traveled down to a dim sum restaurant in Hong Kong where he knew uh, this powerful businessman always ate and shot him dead. He quickly exited, wrapped his gun up in a newspaper, threw it in a garbage and caught the next ferry back to China. A warrant was put out for his arrest and they later caught him in the Hunan province of China. 
technically, he should have been sent back to Hong Kong, but he was tried, convicted, and put to death on the mainland side. Some people think the reason that this happened was precisely because of the powerful associates of the victim um, who wanted the maximum possible penalty for this criminal. There have also been stories of Li Ka-shing, one of the most powerful businessmen in Hong Kong, also using his influence to push criminals who have, been, who have crossed him to be prosecuted in China. Had this extradition bill passed, it would have closed this convenient mechanism for the ultra-wealthy tycoons in Hong Kong. So the protesters certainly had their blessings. And you know who else's blessings they had? Mainland criminals who rely on Hong Kong as an escape route. I got to say, I've personally encountered a kind of guy like this. He's a Shenzhen businessman who owns nightclubs, and I know many of the people he has really screwed over here. He's on track to get a Hong Kong permanent residency soon, and he's exactly the kind of guy who's thankful to these protesters and the international media for fighting against the extradition bill for him. I'd venture to say that generally speaking, in many other circumstances around the world, as a general rule, the more misled and ignorant the masses are, the better it is for the guys who really know what's going on and, and who are the ones who you should really be worried about. So that's it for me on this topic, guys. I said I wanted to keep this short, and I think I've already gone over a bit of my original target here. As I suggested earlier on in this video, you'll start to see more of this type of content mixed in with my interview conversation style videos. I was going back and forth on whether I should create two separate channels, but for now, I'll put both styles of videos on my main channel here. The conversation videos where I sit down with the guests will be far more long format, and I'm interested in expanding those types of videos because of how many interesting people I've encountered in China and how often I've thought to myself, I wish more people could hear this when I'm sitting down and I'm in deep conversation with some of these guys. So that's exactly what you will find me attempting to do with that new series of videos. If what I've done here by breaking down the extradition bill or what I've explained I will be doing more of is something you will enjoy, express your interest by hitting the subscribe button below and that will let me know that I'm kind of pointing in the right direction here. So thanks guys and I will catch you next time.